Okay. So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is David Bloom. I'm uh, part of the VertNet team and a perennial Tadwig hanger on. Um, and I'd like to welcome you to this second webinar uh, of, of two about the evolution of biodiversity information standards. Uh, today, we are presenting in collaboration with the Darwin Core Hour team. Uh, the first session uh, is entitled uh, Darwin Core, a public review uh, by John, uh, by John Vitrark. And he's going to be speaking with us today. And with any luck, we'll stick with us for the entire time. Uh, and he'll give us an overview of the latest Darwin Core review process with more than 40 proposals for enhancement. So he is supported by participants of the Darwin Core maintenance group, uh, many of whom are on this uh, webinar as well. And we're all happy to answer your questions after the talk. Uh, so again, please participate by commenting or adding questions to the chat or in the notes document. And we'll allow John to uh, take it away. Welcome. Hello, I'm gonna put my video on just for a moment so that you can see that I look like a human, at least for the moment. Uh, but we had terrible bandwidth issues here at home in Argentina earlier this morning. And so I'm gonna do my best to keep that to a minimum. Um, and we have a backup plan in case I disappear altogether, which happened earlier today. So uh, you know, I'm John Vichorek. I'm the convener of the Darwin Core Maintenance Group and I'll host today. So the very short story of what we're going to try to accomplish in this webinar is to talk about the improvement of standards for biodiversity related data sharing. And particularly about the role of people in our community to make those changes. Uh, the webinar is specifically to discuss how the Darwin Core Standard evolves in practice and to highlight some examples from the most recent public review for illustration of that. If, um, what this is not is an introduction to Darwin Core, nor will there be sufficient time to present the topic in great detail nor to do a study of the individual proposals that were in the review, nor even to explain all the words that I'm going to use. So I apologize for all those things in advance. It's a matter of uh, available time to get the topic out there. If you do have questions about how to use Darwin Core, we encourage you to use the Darwin Core questions and answers site. Uh, this slide shows some links to that. The site is many topics of discussions uh, people present their questions and we try to answer them. And those answers we try to make part of auxiliary documentation or even to affect change in the Darwin Core Standard itself. Uh, from that page, there are also many recorded webinars. And among them, the very first one is the introduction to Darwin Core that you can look at if that's what you were seeking when you came here. So on to today's topic. Darwin Core is an ever evolving standard in the Biodiversity Information Standards Organization, which we lovingly call TADWIG because of its old name, the Taxonomic Databases Working Group. The Darwin Core is supported by the Darwin Core Maintenance Group, which is made up of volunteers, all volunteer, uh, who are knowledgeable about and are dedicated to making the Darwin Core as useful as it can be. When Darwin Core was first made into a standard in 2009, it actually contained specifications for how change was to be managed for the standard itself because they didn't exist anywhere else. These parts of the Darwin Core were later extracted and adapted into the vocabulary maintenance standard, which consists of a single document, the vocabulary maintenance specification. And that applies to all existing vocabulary standards within TADRIG, not just Darwin Core. So it's under the rules of that document that we proceeded with our public review. So the Darwin Core standard consists of definitions of terms and documents about how to use them in various contexts, such as with RDF or with Darwin Core archives, among other things. Some parts of the standard, such as term identifiers and term definitions and versions of terms, are all designated as normative, which is to say that they are stable content with rigorous processes for change. 
while other parts of the standard, such as the term labels, the usage comments, examples, and how the terms are organized are non-normative. That is to say, they are accessory content made to aid in the use of the standard and make it that much easier to modify those things. Proposals for change to the standard arise from the community, not from a Darwin Core maintenance group, nor from the executive committee, nor anybody else. They're from all of us. And then it consists of requests for new terms, updates to existing terms, or modifications to the documentation. Proposals are normally made as issues using one of two templates in the Darwin Core GitHub repository. But since not everyone is willing or can even use such a means, it's also perfectly feasible and possible to request changes or proposals by email to any member of the maintenance group. The public review is just one phase in the process of maintenance that's outlined in the vocabulary maintenance specification. The review is meant to be a semi-annual process to promote proposal, proposals for change that have achieved a certain level of maturation, let's say. The readiness for public review is determined by the maintenance group, it's our judgment call, let's say, against three justifications for change criteria that are enumerated in the vocabulary maintenance specification. The first one is efficacy, which is to say the change is likely to have the desired effect. The second one is demand. That is, it's not just an idea or a pet idea of some Tadwig member, rather multiple organizations actually need the change or addition in order to better achieve their missions. And then the third criteria is sustainability, in which the, uh, the factor is that the change will not adversely affect existing practice. The latest review was extraordinary in uh, several ways, one of which is that it considered a backlog of 70 distinct proposals for new terms or term changes going back as far as 2014. Normally, this would not be the case. And going forward, we hope it will not ever happen again. Normally, the stale proposals would be abandoned after a demonstrated lack of justification and interest for more than a year. But this latest proposal roundup was the product of waiting for a variety of fundamental developments in Tadwig as an organization to be complete, such as the vocabulary maintenance standard, which appeared during that period, and the complete rebuilding of the Tadwig website. This latest public review has put us on track to keep the process normal from here on. So going forward, evaluation of accumulated issues is expected to happen at least once per calendar year and on a schedule deemed reasonable based on the nature and quantity of accumulated issues and the capacity of the members of the maintenance group to moderate and review those. Proposals that are judged by the maintenance group not to meet all three criteria that I mentioned are not considered mature enough for public review. And those remain in the request state until they can achieve that level of maturity. That is to say the prerequisites are met or until the proposal becomes stale for a lack of activity. 22 of the 70 proposals did not make it to this, past this step in this most recent review. Most of them were because there was uh, no sufficient demonstration of demand. None of those have been removed from existence yet. Proposals that do meet the three prerequisites are prepared by the maintenance group for public review by making the issues that describe them in GitHub and making them as complete, clear, concise, and consistent as possible so that you're not wasting people's time in trying to review them. There were 48 proposals considered in the latest public review. 13 of those were for new terms. One was for an entirely new control vocabulary. That was for the current status term. And the remainder were for changes to existing terms. Changes to existing terms are categorized as normative or non-normative. A non-normative change is one that fixes an error in the definition or modifies the usage comments or examples to clarify how the term can be used. Non-normative changes are not required to go through a formal public review process. And that makes it relatively easy to facilitate clarification we find we just need to add a usage comment or an example in order to help people uh, use the term, 
s sub z times zero. Even so, all the non-normative proposals are also documented on GitHub and they're all open to comment from anyone. And in this latest public review, all changes, both normative and non-normative were included. The purpose of the public review is to achieve consensus that the proposed changes are satisfactory. It's the role of the maintenance group to usher the proposals towards consensus within the review period, which is a minimum of 30 days. There's no requirement that all proposals have to reach consensus. Give me one second. Uh, so that the proposals that don't appear uh, to be reaching consensus uh, within the initial review period uh, remain open for further development. Uh, four of the proposals uh, in the public review this go round did not reach that consensus that John was mentioning. Uh, and they've been left in the uh, open public review uh, in an attempt to reach consensus. Um, those are the subgenus uh, conversation, individual account, the identification qualifier, and the verbatim label. Uh, these will not be included in the next release uh, because they haven't been, uh, they haven't found consensus. Uh, sometimes proposals are deemed complicated, uh, either in the pre uh, review phase or as a result of the public review. Uh, those proposals uh, of this nature are likely to be recommended by the maintenance group to be delegated to a task group to be developed more fully. Uh, those task groups are an official part of the TADWIG process. Uh, an example of a complex proposal is the one to modify the item material sample. Uh, and you can see that that's issue 314 uh, under the Darwin Core uh, issues label. Uh, as of yesterday, there were 128 comments in that issue, even though the uh, proposal was not part of a public review. So you can see how that gets complicated and quickly. The resolution of that issue uh, has potentially broad implications. So if you've got anything to say, uh, feel free to jump in there. Uh, six of the proposals in the public review uh, were recommended for task group resolution. Those in particular were for occurrence status, the vocabulary for occurrence status, preparations, disposition, associated sequences, and biome. So those are all to task group uh, at this point, and we'll see what happens with those uh, in future iterations. So. Proposals that do reach consensus become part of a package that the maintenance group prepares for ratification by the Tadwig Executive Committee. The Executive Committee has 30 days to ensure that due process has been followed and that each proposal satisfies the scrutiny of the Tadwig Technical Architecture Group, otherwise known as the TAG. The role of the Executive Committee at this stage is not to offer new opinions on the content of the proposals, the opportunity for that's already been passed in the public review itself, since the executive committee is the same as the rest of us in terms of being community members. The executive committee can ratify none, some, or all of the proposals in the package that the maintenance group um, presents to them. 38 proposals are currently in the process of being prepared for ratification. The unratified proposals become the responsibility of the maintenance group to remedy whatever has been identified as problematic with them. So their fate is another round potentially of public review or if just something technical has been done incorrectly by the maintenance group, we'll fix it and then get it back on its way. The ratified proposals are incorporated into the body of the Darwin Core standard. During this step, the maintenance group does a whole bunch of things. One is to create the new terms and the new versions for the changed terms and documents and relate them to the ones that they replace. So there's a, a history. The, the screenshot there you're looking at is the history for one example, the life stage term between its current iteration, the 2017 one and the previous one. If we make a new change to life stage, which seems to be uh, on track, there will be yet a new version which will make this 2017 one be replaced by it. 
So even though the replacements like this, Darwin Core has built into it the canonical reference or the canonical identifier, which is everything without the um, with the without the date stuff. So if you look there and see version of, you see http colon slash slash rds.tadwig.org slash dwc slash terms slash life stage. That's the always current identifier for the life stage term in Darwin Core, despite any version history that it might have. This minimizes the effect on users of the standard so they don't have to point to which specific one they're talking about. With the new terms defined, the document containing the complete definitions of all current and past Darwin Core terms is updated by some scripts that we use. And that document is called the list of Darwin Core terms. We call that a normative document, even though it has both normative and non-normative parts in it, because it's the, the basic fundamental documentation of the history of the standard, of the terms in the standard. And then there's the document that most of you are probably more familiar with, is, which is the non-normative user-friendly Darwin Core Quick Reference Guide. Here's a brief tabular summary of the results of the public review. And I'd like to highlight a few of the things on this list that happened. Um, realize that at the bottom, I have a link to all issues that were considered during this milestone during the month of May. On this page, the first column shows the Darwin Core class that is affected. So these are the organizational terms in Darwin Core, things like occurrence, event, location, and taxon. The second column lists all of the terms for which consensus was reached that they should be added. Among these, there's one in particular that's very interesting and that's material citation. It's interesting not only because it's a class rather than a field that you would fill in you know, a spreadsheet or a database, um, and it's a new value for the basis of record term. And it's meant to fill the gap of the literature-based occurrences that did not exist as a, a basis of record term in the past. The third column is a list of all the terms that remain in public review because they could not reach a consensus so far. Uh, this is this, the case for all four of them. They're all four still open and no further progress has been made on any of those four. The final column shows proposals that were recommended for resolution by task groups by the maintenance group because of the un unanticipated ramifications of the pro the changes that were proposed. They essentially were more complicated than we expected them to be once we started talking more about them openly in the whole community. So among these, there are lots of different examples. One, a simple addition is something like the subfamily. That went through to ratification without any commentary whatsoever. Um, realize, of course, that plenty of commentary had been made and the demand for it had been achieved before it ever went to public review. Once it was in public review, smooth sailing, it just uh, was acceptable to everyone. Another example um, is of a simple change, but that was normative, that it, uh, and that was for georeference verification status. There was a little bit of discussion, but it was easy to resolve that discussion. And this one had to do with the organization of the georeference verification status in the, um, the classes of Darwin Core. A third simple change, but non-normative, was the one for country. And that just had to do with making better examples. A complicated addition turned out to be the proposal for verbatim label. That's one of those that continues in public review. It ended up being uh, the subject of a great deal of commentary and people wondering about what exactly would go into it, 
how would it be formatted? How would you capture different kinds of indicators of space on a label and such things like that? So that one remains in public review, hoping that a consensus can be reached. And we'll probably talk a little bit more about that one in our discussion here in a second. Another complicated change was that for a current status, something we actually originally thought would be a non-normative change, but we wisely categorized it as normative, uh, turned out to be quite controversial and we could not come to an agreement about it. And that is destined for a task group to try to resolve. Another complicated addition that didn't even make it to public review was that for material sample. There were proposals for changes to material sample. It did not make it to public review, not because there were, uh, not because it didn't achieve all of the three prerequisites, but rather because even before the public review, it was clear that there were huge ramifications about what was being proposed. And it turns out that that particular task group is probably going to have to tackle three of the other uh, terms in that fourth column, the one for preparations, disposition, and associated sequences as part of its mission. So that gives you an idea of the kinds of things that were dealt with. Um, the task group formation is one of the topics in, our, in the series later in August. That, among other things, about how standards are built as well as maintained outside of this specific one for the Darwin Core review that just happened, which was our scope for today. So thank you, especially for all the participation in making the review what it was and for the call to have us present what we've done today to try and make it more clear how that all works in case it wasn't clear while you were participating. We might better have done this beforehand, but at least this way we have something to talk about and to show uh, happened during a real and recent um, a public review. So thank you. And the floor is open for any kind of question whatsoever. And I suspect some have been accumulated while we've been going here. Great, thank you so much, John. Um, I'm glad the technical difficulties lasted only for a very few seconds, uh, which was great. Uh, so um, let's see here. So Deb, you said we have uh, some questions pending. They are in the Google Doc if you go down to near the okay. bottom and I've made them all blue. All right. You should be able to see them easily. Sounds good. So let's see here, what have we? So the first question, uh, John, uh, is how is demand assessed? Good question. So how is demand determined? This is a good one. And it's one on which I made a mistake during this review. So I'm happy that you pointed it out. Demand traditionally was a bit vague and it was a statement to the effect that you need two independent parties who need to share data who can't do it unless the change or the addition happens. So now you get into, okay, what is independent and who constitutes a party and so on. None of that is still very well defined, but we have kind of a working, uh, a working definition in the maintenance group. Basically, it can't be two old Tadwig fogies who decide that they have a good idea and they want their pet idea to become reality. Not good enough. There has to be a demonstrated need for it that some organization, some multiple organizations actually need it to do the job that they want to do. So uh, the, a very nice example of how this turned out in this, uh, this review period was that one of the proposals was without sufficient demand. It had been there, I think it's issue number 14, and it's been there since, I don't know when, 2013 or something, was the verbatim label. And so 
in preparation for this public review, I made the statement that it looks like this one is in need of a demonstration of demand. It's not going to go forward without that. And uh, somebody stepped up and took the initiative to say, yeah, this is still live and, and very important to us. Can we get it on the table? And I said, well, you still need to demonstrate demand. So a public um, poll was run among collections using various different kinds of collection management systems and in different stages of digitization and so on to demonstrate that there was an entire community out there who were begging for it. My mistake was to say, OK, that can constitutes one party, whereas really it should have been sufficient. You know, there were, I don't know how many institutions that answered that poll in the affirmative and with enthusiasm. And I should have sort of uh, given the credit where it was due to somebody that took the initiative to make that poll and to show the, the demand and so on. Uh, even so, other sources of demand were demonstrated on top of that, so all was fine in the end, but I won't make that same mistake going forward. It does underline something that we as a community need to do. One of the two things I think that was very important coming out of this review period. One is to define that. What really are the measurable criteria for the requirements for something to go to public review? So thanks for that question. Uh, excellent. OK, so the uh, subsequent question here, uh, is there a recommended method for introducing non-Darwin core terms that are needed for users nefarious, uh, nefarious purposes? Good. For example, example, all right, as well as a scientific name, have a formatted scientific name that contains a parsed HTML or XML sized version of the name for use in applications or a class ID or family ID as well as a taxon concept ID. Right. So this is a term that is well defined uh, what it is supposed to do and it's not in Darwin core and somebody wants it there. The question is, the, the process is to elaborate what it is that you want by, in this case, it would be a new term, going into GitHub, creating a new issue, selecting the template for a new term, and making sure that everything that's in that template gets filled out. By filling out that template, you should be uh, um, you should be given sufficient information about how to justify the existence of the term. Describe what it's supposed to do, why, and then also who needs it. All that's in that term template. As that uh, gets entered and built, the, the maintenance group will be on top of it watching and immediately try to facilitate that, that proposal proposal be made complete and clear and satisfy all the requirements. So it, it shouldn't be a huge obstacle. It might be an obstacle that it's a, a big unknown. But once you do it, you'll realize, ah, oh, that wasn't so bad. All I need to do is fill out this form, basically, and everybody's going to help me get it on its way. Hopefully that answered the Nefarious intent. <laughs> nefarious is fine because it will be up for public scrutiny. It's for public scrutiny, exactly. And we love nefarious public scrutiny. Yes. Uh, okay, so uh, question, uh, next question is more uh, of a clarification. Uh, somebody was not entirely clear on the criteria used to ratify or not ratify a proposal. A uh, concrete example would be appreciated. And then um, they did uh, the tag. I wasn't entirely sure what the TAG was myself. Right. So ratification is a specific uh, step that is a rubber stamp 
by the executive committee admitting the changes into the body of the standard. All of the groundwork for it should have been done by the maintenance group to make it clear and obvious that the change is copacetic, that it's all been done correctly and all of the right um, work has been done. So a concrete example of why that might be rejected happened during a recent review of the chronometric age extension in which the extension was presented to the executive committee as a complete final package ready to go. But the executive committee, presumably with the help of the technical architecture group, who is the technical uh, consultant, let's say on the topic, said, wait, was the ABCD standard consulted to make sure that all of the mappings that are being presented are complete and correct. That because the technical architecture group is interested that standards work together. And so the, um, so they wanted to make sure that that work had been done and it wasn't clear in the presentation that had been made. So the resolution of it was simply to say, uh, yes, sorry, executive committee, we didn't say so, but yes, that has all been done already. So a simple solution, but that's the, the sort of checks and balances that happen at that level. So as an example to those who are newer to this, I'd like to jump in and just say from, from my perspective, I'm, I'm always, I'm fascinated by this concept of a tag. So these individuals actually take all the different work that's being done by all the different working groups in Tadwick that may have some overlap, for example, in what they're working on or expertise needed across those different groups. And they sort of like playing chess, manage to keep all those pieces, parts, in their heads at one time in order to provide all of us in those individual groups with advice and guidance on, on how to move forward or, and how to avoid um, pitfalls. So it's amazing. So thank you to the so I, I haven't fully answered what the tag is. Oh, um, sorry, John. <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, so the technical architecture group is another set of volunteers. Um, it's a committee rather than an interest group or maintenance group. And the committee that is, I believe, uh, constituted by the executive committee itself. I'm not sure exactly how it comes to be, um, but somebody needs to be appointed to lead that. And right now and recently, that person uh, is Nikki Nicholson and James Macklin is, agreed to sort of co-lead that with Nikki. Um, yeah, Paula says, confirms that it is appointed by the executive committee. Um, the rest is are people that are co-opted from the community who have particular knowledge across standards or across technologies so that there's a broad view of the different kinds of uh, biodiversity information that Chadwick has its fingers in. So John, uh, thank you for that clarification. There was a, a comment in the chat from Doug Palmer, uh, who I believe asked the question that you might wanna take a, a quick look at. Uh, basically says, uh, the question came from him and it was more about introducing a non-Darwin core term for a specific application where it may be, or where it may not be appropriate for use in the Darwin core standard, but which you uh, would like to align with the Darwin core approach. There's a lot in there. I'm not sure I'd, I'd have to understand what it was that was trying to be done. I mean, it, from one perspective, if you wanted it to align with the Darwin core approach, the maintenance group would be perfectly happy to review that and see and give it advice about it. But if it's not going to be a Darwin core term, how would it be used? I mean, could you imagine this being 
for example, something available in the GBIF integrated publishing toolkit, even though it's not Darwin Core, that already happens. How does it happen? It happens in extensions that aren't standards. And there are many of them, many terms that are used in use there um, that have nothing to do with Darwin Core, but need to be aligned with the Darwin Core approach. And that methodology is actually one way to do proof of concept, to try something out, make a term for yourself, get it publishable via extensions in the IPT, show it works, work out the kinks, and then bring it to Darwin Core as a proposal. So Doug, I don't know uh, if you have a microphone, if you'd like to, you're, you're welcome to unmute if you'd like to follow up with that or if you have anything else, if not, perfectly fine. Uh, oh, um, look, I can follow it up some other time. I just had a sort of basic question about whether there was a method by which you could structure things, a recommended method by which you could structure things so that you weren't um, going to sort of damage yourself later. I have a tendency to need to include a lot of contextual information in some of the stuff I'm exchanging, and I tend to mint my own URIs as a result of that. Um, and I was just asking whether there was a, yeah, sort of best practices for that. I would think that, have a look at um, two things, depending on how broad, like if it's a huge body of vocabulary that you add that is thematic, you might look at something like the Audubon core um, which deals with the subject matter of media, biodiversity of media, or if it's less broad than something like that, you could take a look at the recently ratified Darwin Core vocabulary enhancement, which is the chronometric age extension. So that's specifically meant to be something that could be included in the integrated publishing toolkit and is a part of Darwin Core but is kept separate for the sake of uh, its specific nature. Not everybody needs it. Both of those are good, well-documented ways of developing a vocabulary that would be easily integrated, let's say. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Doug. Uh, that's great. Um, one additional question uh, was uh, to you, John, obviously, uh, where did the subfamily conversation take place that you referenced? All in the issue in GitHub. It's number I do not have on the top of my It's uh, 320 and it is, uh, the link is the link with the there? question. Yeah. The link is with the so question. The entire history of it is in that GitHub issue so it appears uh we have need for that moment of 13 seconds of silence to see if anybody else would like to add a question either to the chat or to the document directly i'll use a couple of those seconds to to give thanks for the demand to have a second episode of this first version of this first webinar to reach more people. It turned out to be extremely important given the numbers of people that actually attended both of them or either of them. Ellie, I see, asks, were there any questions that came up in the first session that might be interesting to revisit? Yes. There was the question of consensus. What is consensus? How is it reached or not reached? If that's of interest, we can go into that. Sure. I mean, we have, uh, we have about uh, five minutes or so. All right, the consensus, the outer working definition of it is that there is no dissenting opinion for a period of 30 days following the most uh, recent demonstration of agreement. Give you a second to absorb that. <laughs> Basically, nobody said no for 30 days. So 
can I give a concrete example, John, though? I mean, real quick. Yeah. I, I, so really quick, there's been dissent like in verbatim label. But if you get to the point where you summarize all the changes, requests, and concerns, and you put up a final product and say, is anybody, is everybody okay with this one? And if you get a thumbs up on that, then you're good. It's not about one dissenting voice in the GitHub ticket, correct? No, it doesn't mean that if anybody ever said no, that, that that's not consensus. It means we have more work to do in order for people to agree. And the job of the maintenance group during the public review is to be on top of that. And so one of the things I tried to do was to review the often very long conversations and make current summaries of the status quo, what, we, what it looks like we agree to and what it looks like we don't agree to that needs to be solved. Because without that, it's like you have to read a newspaper every morning in order to understand what's going on and with 48 different terms under consideration that was just overwhelming so yeah it's a matter of the maintenance group trying to say look this is what it seems like you don't agree on can you make a forward progress about this part of the disagreement and then i think that we can uh, make consensus and then see if that's okay for a uh, full 30 days since the, there was a change made to it. So uh, one just popped into a uh, right. chat from, from Deb. Yeah. So how, how do individuals how indicate, individuals or group indicate that they support it or that they don't support it? Not supporting it's easy. You have to write a comment saying, uh, I don't like this. That isn't sufficient really to be a sending opinion. You, pretty much got to say why. You have to justify your dissent in order for it to really be considered. That's not official, that's just how we operate. Um, the other thing that happened this time, and I think it's because some people read the frequently asked questions that were referred to before the public review began. And in there it says, uh, it's really hard to know if you agree if you don't participate in the conversations. But if even that is too much, it's still useful for you to put the, um, your opinion by emoticons when people comment about things or when, uh, or, or about anything that happens in the discussion. Or issue. Were there other questions that came up this morning that we have? that you remember, John? I'm looking. I think that one Paula's brought up here was uh, a sub theme mm -hmm. that a lot of people were somewhat um, timid about participating in conversations for a couple of reasons. One being a language limitation and a second one being a knowledge limitation. It's, I remember my first days in Tadwig, I was absolutely overwhelmed and intimidated by the conversations that were going on. I went in there thinking I knew everything and I instantly knew almost nothing. And it was three years before I felt comfortable to really open my mouth, truthfully. And now I can't shut up. So if you wanna reach that state, <laughs> then keep with it, keep asking. And like Paula is saying, we as a community, Tadwig in particular, can do better to try and make things more accessible in multiple languages. Very okay. true. Um, it um, also Ellie. looks like, uh, Deb, there's a call. Um, there's a call for a, a task group to develop a set of emojis for GitHub. Um, so oh, yeah. Tad, Tadwig will have to tick that up. Ellie, were you trying to say something? Uh, yep, I was just going to ask um, for the uh, for the issues that uh, didn't reach consensus and are either still under review or are moving off to a task group, if people are interested to contribute to either that continuing discussion, for example, for the verbatim label or want to be involved say, in the preparations task group, uh, how would they go about doing that? That still remains in the issue tracker itself. Pretty much everything goes through those issues. The justification for that is that it's open and that it's archived. So it's, it allows us to keep the full history of the conversation that was had. Um, sometimes, I don't know if you're particularly interested in that one 
uh, uh, that one issue or something like the material sample one where it's in the process of, of becoming a task group now, people are committing to being involved and asking to be put on a mailing list and things like that. So uh, all that still is happening. Those um, demonstrations of interest and so on are still all happening right there in the GitHub issues. Um, material sample is a very topical discussion in the Atlas at the moment. So there may well be some Atlas people who would like to put their hands up to participate. That's great, thanks. Welcome. We can talk about another time too, the potential, I haven't used it yet for anything. I have a private repo where I tried it out. There's a new discussion feature inside GitHub where you could take some of these issues, move them into discussion, talk about them and have these long conversations there, explain things, pop out, and then go back to the ticket and put like the summary items. But that might be a way in which we might figure out ways that people can do things like um, participate in other languages and put translations and things like that that came up that James raised in the chat. In terms of the specific question that James put there, can comments, issues, et cetera, be generated in other languages than English? Absolutely. To me, whatever language comes in, it's our job to try and uh, respond. Excellent. So I think uh, as we come up on, on the hour here, or at least where I am, we're coming up on an hour and not a half an hour as it might be for some people. Uh, are there any last questions? We might be able to squeeze one more in before John's internet completely goes kaput. <laughs> and it's okay if we don't have one. I think Anna's comment is, is interesting, that it would be useful um, because conversations can long, get long and confusing. That's also a language issue. There's a lot of jargon going on. There's a lot of history unstated that's going on that ends up making it a conversation for the elite who've been there since the conversation began. And that's not really fair. We talked a bit with Deb earlier about how we might do call outs and things as moderators of issues to review with a critical eye things that not everybody's going to understand. Like the word RDF goes by and it's critical to the conversation, but if you don't know what RDF is, you've just been excluded. That we could do things like um, you know, comments on those things to, to help fill in the gaps that people might have. So I noted this morning, John does do interim summaries of the pertinent issue for the topic at hand. So here's where the term is, it's met the demand, but it hasn't met this other criteria. But we need these other kinds of sort of pop outs that are, oh, this term got used. FYI, this link, you know, go see this or something like that. Just as an aside, um, even though the language and sometimes the conversation can be confusing and perhaps even over some people's heads, uh, it's always perfectly acceptable to send a direct email to somebody to, to ask questions. If you'd rather not make it something in a group, you can send John or me or William or Deb or, or Ellie or anybody a direct email asking questions. And, and uh, generally, even though we're pretty scary in person uh, via email, we're, we're, we're usually much more friendly and, and will respond. So um, that, that's always a possibility too. So uh, we've uh, hit our hour um, and I just want to uh, thank everybody once again for, uh, for joining us uh, for my evening, for some of your mornings, for some of your middle of the nights. Um, I will remind you, for those of you especially who came in a bit late, that uh, I had a call for uh, uh, the call for abstracts has gone out and that also uh, the Audubon core uh, review will begin tomorrow. So those are three things to keep on your calendar or an open tab in your browser if you wish and you're all welcome to participate in all of those. Uh, Deb, do you have any last words for folks? Thank you. Thank you Excellent. to everybody, moderator, yeah. presenters, 
hosts that are taking all the technical things in the background, all the work that went into putting all of this together and the community participation has been amazing. And more of that, please. And hope that many people here um, felt empowered and engaged and, and see the way going forward to, to do that more. So thank you. Yeah, excellent. So thanks everyone for coming and uh, keep an eye on your email for announcements of uh, upcoming conversations, discussions and events. Farewell. <laughs>